Um, uh, and uh, uh, Rob uh, Nicholas from uh, the Philos uh, Project, and uh, our friend uh, Alberto Fernandez, um, Ambassador Fernandez, uh, which has been a great supporter, as well as Robert uh, on uh, Lebanese Christian issues. So I want to thank uh, all of you for being with us. And uh, I would uh, leave it uh, up to you, Peter, and we'll take it from there on uh, discussions. Thank you so much, Tafik. Again, thank you to everyone joining us on Facebook Live and over uh, Zoom this afternoon. Uh, over the last uh, few months, and re really even the last few weeks, we've seen the situation in Lebanon uh, develop rapidly. Uh, what we've seen is attempts uh, from Hezbollah and uh, with pressure from Iran to try and gain more control over the country. We've seen increasing pressure on Christian populations uh, to be pushed out of positions of leadership in some cases. Uh, we've seen Israel increasingly anxious about the security situation with activities uh, from Hezbollah next door. Uh, and what's striking about all these different issues is that they all are, are really uh, pieces of the Trump administration's Middle East priorities, their agenda. And we're starting to see almost the Venn diagrams of all these different issues overlapping uh, with Lebanon in the middle. Uh, so we thought it was timely and important to convene a conversation on this subject and uh, what the U.S. might do policy-wise and the, uh, to understand the situation better. So to break this issue down, uh, we brought three of the uh, in, uh, individuals that immediately came to mind as experts on this subject. And I'll uh, Tafik has introduced them a little. I'll give them a brief bio before we launch into questions. Uh, we have His Excellency Elias Zidane, uh, Maronite Catholic Bishop. Uh, His Excellency Zidane is uh, from Lebanon and is a Maronite Catholic Bishop in the United States. He has served as the third eparch of the eparchy of Our Lady of Lebanon, Los Angeles, since 2013. We have uh, former Ambassador Alberto Fernandez. Ambassador Fernandez is the president of the Middle East Broadcasting Network. Uh, he has served as the U.S. State Department uh, coordinator for the Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications from 2012 to 2015 uh, and retired from his time with the State Department in 2015 after many years. We also have uh, Robert Nicholson. Robert Nicholson is the founder and executive director of the Philos Project. He holds his B.A in Hebrew studies uh, from Binghamton University and uh, is both a JD and an MA in Near East history from Syracuse University and is also a former Marine. Uh, so gentlemen, uh, thank you. I wanna start the conversation, uh, get us started here with a question uh, for uh, Bishop Zidane, uh, Excellency Zidane. Uh, President Trump has made it clear that one of his priorities is to protect religious freedom, uh, specifically preserving Christian communities in the Middle East. Are you seeing an incre Lebanon increasingly become a focal point for this specific policy? And, and please feel free to take a minute to share some of the history and the context of the Christian community in Lebanon. Uh, thanks, Peter, uh, and thanks to IDC and to everybody who's participating with us. The Christians in Lebanon are, you know, from the beginning, that's the ones if I want to use the term, they made Lebanon with its own national geographic today borders, especially this year is the 100th anniversary where the Patriarch announced, you know, with the French government at that time, we were under the French mandate to make Lebanon with its own independent nation, first under the mandate and after became independent in 1943. Therefore, the Christians are not strangers their original citizens of that country. <laughs> However, along the years, this slowly, slowly, the, Lebanon, the Lebanese Christians that start losing their grip on, on the power of, they start sharing more and more. And now we, we see it that becoming different, uh, you know, presence and, and, and role as well. Uh, I know President Trump said we don't want to lose any of the minorities. However, maybe this started in Iraq after, you know, when ISIS start attacking and the American government right away felt the need, they need to do something. And Lebanon is still is not that clear. However, what I want to use the term persecutions comes in different ways. Some direct persecution, yes, I want, unless you become this, I will kill you. 
and what is what we call a slow persecution and well planned persecution, which means you start losing little bit by little, putting pressure on you. And every time you need any decision to be made, you can, you're not able to make it. How many times we were not able to elect a president unless after so many months and years before these things came into existence. Uh, for example, the last before it was elected President Aoun, as it, was, it took almost two years and little over two years before because Hezbollah said, I'm not going to let this happen unless I get my man. And cabinet would take forever to be formed. Those are, and anytime those type of uh, instability and pushover, this as a Christian would start giving up right away. They fear the government, the country is not mine and I'm leaving. And always the Christians in Lebanon, they're always considered their allies of the West automatically. They're always labeled, you're allies of the United States, you're allies of the Western world, to, you know, to a certain degree. And that, that's put Lebanon and the Christian of Lebanon in very uh, unique place to play. The vocation of Lebanon is to keep that country as really democratic as much as, you know, because the only democratic country where they have some balance of power in the whole Middle East. You have, take out Israel, you know, Israelis, but take all the Arab world. They say it's democracy, but in reality, there is no democracy. The only place that still, despite everything, because of the Christians in Lebanon. In fact, one, and Lebanon's, it's essential to the Western world to stay that democrat. It's important to the Muslim world and the Arab world because as one of the Muslim princes one time told our patriarch, he said, the minute I come to Lebanon, I smell the freedom. I'll be able to do whatever I want to do if I want to use it. And for Israel, you don't need another fanatic country that could threaten the presence of Israel as well and be always at the edge of war and creating problems. That's why it's... it's in the best interest of the whole world to keep Lebanon as free, as democratic, as independent and sovereign as much as possible. And the only way you could this make this happen by strengthening the presence of Christians, not to uh, overpower all the others and make them uh, servants or dimmies, no, but you need the Christians to feel always they are at equal footing of everybody else and they have the right to express their opinion. Yeah. And that, that Lebanon could, could uh, come to that perspective. Mm. I'm afraid that Lebanon is becoming more and more hostage to Iranian interest, to Hezbollah. And this is obvious. And any time you see those things because of the grip of Hezbollah, they makes it stronger. The last, you know, uh, all this cabinet to be formed is, is Obviously, it's Hezbollah making in some way, even though they say it's independent. There is no independence in Lebanon. They're always, in some way, they have to be belonging to somebody and supported by somebody. And this is would strengthen the position of Hezbollah. If the American government feels, let the states fall, this would be disastrous for, because that's when Hezbollah can take over easily and the Christian will give up right away. And those what I'm afraid of we need to keep that presence of uh, involvement of the American administration should be a lot stronger and better to keep those Christians alive. Because Thank Lebanon, okay. to stay what we call the historic vocation of Pope John Paul II said, Lebanon is more than a country, is a message to the East and to the West. From that perspective, I feel that uh, we need to make sure Lebanon does not collapse economically, doesn't collapse politically, it doesn't collapse socially. It doesn't collapse at every level. And I feel right now, Lebanon is in intensive care, is a patient, and I don't feel anybody is visiting that. Like coronavirus, is a quarantine. Nobody's touching because they're afraid to contract anything. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening to Lebanon. The whole world, they're washing their hands. You know, it's like, let them fall. Let them deal with their problems. And that's what my concern as as Maronite, Christian, Catholic person. And as a Lebanese, I want for the whole Lebanon to feel that perspective. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, Ambassador Fernandez, I want to shift to you. Uh, something that His Excellency mentioned was uh, the rise of Hezbollah. 
And uh, what we've seen from the Trump administration is they've been unwavering in their commitment to counter Iran's regional ambitions uh, on almost every front. And we've, and it would appear uh, that the maximum pressure campaign has limited Iran's ability to project power through finance, financially through largesse to their, their constituencies. Uh, and it seems Iran is turning to more aggressive measures on the ground in countries like Lebanon and Iraq. Uh, are we seeing Lebanon increasingly becoming uh, maybe a ground zero uh, for the administration's ability to confront Iran directly? <clears throat> Well, uh, you know, we're actually, this is an interesting time to ask this question. We're about the two year uh, mark of uh, the U.S. Um, uh, pushing away from the, uh, the so-called nuclear agreement, the JCPOA, and uh, embarking in a, you know, uh, a policy of increased pressure or, or maximum pressure on on Iran uh, in the region. And it's, I think it has had some positive effects. It certainly raised the price uh, of Iran, the cost for Iran of its adventurism uh, and its militarism in the region. But there's a problem. And I'm, I'm speaking as somebody who's generally supportive of the administration when it comes to Iran, which is in foreign policy, you know, you come out with things, but your adversary is also thinking of what they're going to do. They're not just standing around waiting for you to hit them over the head with sanctions. And what happened with Hezbollah and Hezbollah's growth and its hegemony over, over Lebanon is actually similar in a way. I mean, they're very different countries but similar to the experience of what happened in Iraq. What do I mean by Iraq and Lebanon? In both those situations, you have an adversary, Iran, the world's number one state sponsor of terror, a pariah state, a state with all sorts of sanctions, a state which this administration and even previous administrations tried to confront, to limit, to put in a hole. Um, you know, I, I disagree with the Obama administration's policy on the JCPOA, but it was an effort to also try to stop Iran, at least in one area, even though it, it left alone other areas. But what Iran and Iran's proxies and allies in the region have done is figured out a way to avoid the pain of a lot of this, uh, which is coming down from them. <clears throat> and that is to deepen their involvement as parasites on a host, on two states, two governments, which are actually on paper, friendly to the United States, open to the West, open to the international community, which are the Lebanese government and the Iraqi government. Now, this is not to say that Hezbollah in Lebanon and uh, the Iraqi militias in, 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 in you know, Iranian controlled Iraqi militias control 100% the government of Iraq or the government of Lebanon. It's more nuanced than that. Uh, it's not 100% control. It's 100% or near 100% influence, near 100% ability to project soft power on the ground. So, Lebanon is indeed ground zero, as Iraq is, but governments, the U.S. government, faces a basic dilemma. Our policy is to support Lebanon. As Sayyidna just said, you know, Lebanon should not be abandoned, and the Lebanese people need help. Certainly, Lebanon is a state for it to collapse would be very problematic. And yet, the very state that we want to talk about saving, the very institutions that we talk about strengthening, are the very institutions which are being used by Hezbollah to some extent or another. That's not to say they're all controlled. I'm not one of those who believe, as some critics say, you know, uh, the LAF is Hezbollah or the Central Bank of Lebanon is Hezbollah. I would not go that far. I don't believe that to be the case. But the power to influence is there throughout the body politic of Lebanon, almost exclusive. There are a few instances institutions, their civil society, this private sector that maybe can avoid it more than others. But the problem for the U.S. government, for American administration is how do you separate the parasite from the host? How do you target the parasite, which is killing the host, which is killing Lebanon, 
uh, you know, without killing the host, without hurting the, 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 the country, which this terrorist group and this terrorist group, which is not an ally of Iran. Hezbollah is not a, uh, you know, in an alliance with Iran. Hezbollah is joined at the hip with Iran. Hezbollah and Iran are strategically, ideologically, politically, intellectually, in every way, a, a full partners of a regional project of hegemony in Lebanon and everywhere else. It's that if famous line or infamous, infamous line of uh, Hassan Nasrallah when asked if he wanted to see an Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, uh, excuse me, he wanted to see an Islamic Republic of Lebanon. He said, I don't want to see an Islamic Republic of Lebanon. I want to see a, Le a Lebanon, which is a part of the Islamic state ruled by the Mahdi and his supreme leader, the supreme guide on earth, who is Ayatollah uh, Khamenei at the time. I think it was Khomeini at the time when he said it. So this is the challenge for U.S. foreign policy. Pressure Iran, yes. But how do we get from here to there? How do we basically, in deepening our pressure on, uh, on Iran and on Hezbollah, which is an essential part, which is the right arm of Iran in Lebanon, how do we do it in ways which doesn't destroy the state? And how do we decouple the state from uh, 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 Hezbollah's existence, because what ha has happened is Lebanon, with all its beauty, with all its pluralism, with all its communities, which bring such richness uh, and diversity uh, and spirituality to the region, is also today a safe haven for Hezbollah and Iran. It's a safety valve for Iran and Hezbollah. It it's, it's a place where they feel they can do whatever they want, whatever they need to do. That is the problem for U.S. foreign policy. Uh, and we can talk later, but I think, you know, we, there's some challenges, there's some ideas of how you could do that without hurting Lebanon any further than it's already being hurt that need to be looked at. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Robert, I want to bring you in now. Uh, there's another aspect of this conversation I think is really important, uh, and that is that the Trump administration has arguably uh, been one of the, probably the strongest supporters of the U.S. relationship with Israel of any presidency that we've had. Uh, and uh, he's made it a clear priority that he supports the safety uh, and security of the state of Israel. Uh, and I think there's increasingly questions about if Hezbollah within Lebanon represents uh, a existential or near-term threat to that security. Uh, so I th first maybe address what is that question and then possibly uh, how does how do you think the administration uh, should be viewing this in the framing of is sort of support for Lebanon, support for Israel? Is that incompatible, or is there a potentially a uh, uh, a complementary policy that has support for both? Thank you, Peter, and <clears throat> thanks to IDC for hosting this call. It's a very important topic, very very dear to me. You know, it's there's a spot in Israel right by the northern border, right on the border with Lebanon. Uh, there's a village there, it's called Matula. And if you stand in Matula, as I've done many times, and you look across the border into the area around Marjayun, you see a billboard. And on the billboard is a picture of the Dome of the Rock, the Islamic holy site inside Jerusalem, and a picture of, I believe it's Ayatollah Khomeini. And in Arabic, it says Adimun we're coming. And standing there as an American, naturally that's disturbing to me. But for Israelis who live in Matula and Israelis writ large, it's, it's more than an abstract threat. This is a threat that's backed up not only with the 150,000 rockets inside Lebanon that are pointed toward Israel at any given time of day, but also backed up by the, the entire infrastructure of the Islamic Republic of Iran. These days, Hezbollah has been amassing precision guided weapons, which is a game changer. These are the weapons that can find you uh, with computers. You know, they follow a path as opposed to indiscriminate missiles. And that naturally makes the Israelis even more concerned. That's not even mentioning the civil war just next door in Syria that hasn't yet 
calmed down where Iranian influence is also being amassed. So from Israel's perspective, Israel, uh, a solid ally of the United States, this situation cannot go on any longer. This something has to give. And I think, you know, to answer your question, unfortunately, the convergence of Lebanon these days, or at least one aspect of it with US foreign policy interests is, is to the extent that it's crossed into the, uh, the line of sight of, of Israel. I think a conflict between these two countries, or at least between Israel and Hezbollah, um, is, is not only um, uh, possible, but likely. And so I think that the United States has a massive interest in stopping this conflict before it starts. And I, I believe that US policy should make Israel and Lebanon together the linchpin of its strategy in the Near East. I won't go into that here, but I think that there are uh, unique reasons that these countries matter to the US. I myself am both, to answer that last part of your question, both uh, very pro-Israel and very pro-Lebanon. And I don't believe personally that there's a contradiction between them. I'll go even further. I actually think these two countries share similar DNA, believe it or not, even though they're the two countries right now who seem almost the most at odds or the closest to going to open conflict, they're actually very similar. Um, and I think that their, their existence is aligned with both the interests and the values of the West. They're both uh, countries that are exceptional, meaning they're both based on underlying historical cultural realities, but they were founded in the 20th century for a very particular purpose. They had an exceptional reason for existing. And the, His Excellency mentioned the purpose, the founding purpose of Lebanon, uh, the French in 1920 made essentially a, a policy decision largely driven by their connection to the Maronites of Mount Lebanon and created the Grand Liban, this, this new entity carved out of greater Syria, uh, really for the purpose of uh, protecting Christians as an ethno-religious minority. And Israel, as we know, was sort of the same thing. In 1917, the British made a similar statement that said, we are going to look with favor on a special Jewish thing uh, in the land of Palestine. They're both Western affiliated. They both face the same enemies in extreme pan-Arabism and extreme pan-Islamism. Uh, they, they share a lot more than they don't share. Um, unfortunately, where Israel has a strong majority, a Jewish majority, um, and therefore has a certain amount of confidence in its regime, a certain amount of security and stability, Lebanon, insofar as it is a mixed salad of these different uh, demographic groups, is, is much less stable, right? The, there's, there's a mixed population and therefore there's a more mixed vision which draws in these regional powers who try to exploit the situation for their own benefit. And unfortunately, while Israel has benefited from outside powers like the US who support its exceptional character. The outside powers that get involved in Lebanon all the time um, are against its exceptional character. In fact, they're trying to, uh, depends on who you, you know, who it is. It's, they're trying to Islamize it or Arabize it uh, and completely erase the founding purpose of the country. And, and I'll say one more thing on that. The, the difference between the two countries is that while Israel, just by the data, shares a, or has a massive amount of support among the American people and therefore strong support in the American uh, government, Lebanon for, for most Americans is a black box. They don't really know what, what Lebanon is. They think of it as just one more Arab state located in a region filled with people who hate us. And when you think about Israel, for those Israelis who are standing in Metula or any other part of the country, when they think of Lebanon, they think essentially what we think of when we say Vietnam, right? Lebanon was the, the quagmire that sucked Israel in and that killed all its boys. And actually right now there's a television series playing on Israeli TV called Milchama Blishem, the, the war without a name, which talks about the 
Israeli occupation and experience in Lebanon, which for Israelis is a very uh, touchy issue. So Lebanon is sort of a convergence of everything, but for that same reason, it's it's a convergence of nothing, right? There's no there's no clear path forward, as as Ambassador Fernandez said. There's this dilemma about how do you separate what's good inside Lebanon from what's bad. The problem is most Americans don't even know that there's a difference and that both of these sides exist in the country. This is why I make a big point with all the work that we do at Philos in trying to explain Lebanon as, as, as the bishop said very accurately, as a country with a mission and a message. Uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's something that needs to be much better known and I think it would lead to better and stronger US support. Thanks, Robert. Uh, I'm going to have a follow-up question for each of you sort of along the lines of what we've been talking about, but uh, as we go into those, I want to let the audience know there's a Q&A feature at the bottom of your uh, window if you've registered to be on the call, uh, and you can jump in there and input your questions, and in just a couple minutes, we're going to transition uh, to going through some of those audience questions. So please be thinking of those and uh, go on ahead and enter them into that Q&A uh, option at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just as a follow-up, uh, back to you, Your Excellency, uh, taking the situation uh, that you uh, and really all the panelists have laid out here uh, so well, what are some of the ways the United States could engage with Lebanon and with the Christian community there uh, to ensure that the administration's priority to preserve these indigenous Christian communities in the region uh, is advanced there in Lebanon? I, I think there is two for me, important uh, elements that need to be treated. First, the political side and the economical side. And the political side, first to let the Lebanese people feel that are well, they're not forgotten. Because we feel that we're forgotten or we dealt with and we like it traded instead of being really looked at as an important element in the mm. stability of the whole region as well and maybe to give a proper consideration to the whole political regime and government to make sure that the institution in Lebanon are well respected, to care for it, to make sure the policy shift will be well known and be well taken care of it in, in different way. Maybe needs to have somebody to give it that importance and let United States lead the way. It's not like uh, we don't hear anything. Okay, there is an American ambassador in Lebanon, but we need to make sure that Lebanon is more than regular business. It's more than that. We need to make sure the American government feels that Lebanon is important for their stability. The second thing is economically, and I would say here they could help the Lebanese in, in various ways. First, and help the Christians. The schools in Lebanon are suffering, you know, from the people are not able to pay the hospitalization, the job opportunity. We don't want, we're not beggars. We don't want, we need to make sure we, there is, and especially with unemployment around 40, 50%, you know, which means this will suck the whole, you know, uh, brain out of Lebanon to look for somewhere else to go find a job opportunity. Because if you don't have a hope, you don't have a job, you're going to look for somewhere else to have a job. And this what really suck and leave. And the Christian were the first ones to leave. They will be well-educated. They want to find a good job. If they could help have that stability politically and create for that economically to have encourage and maybe encourage some companies to open plans in Lebanon or something, or even now with virtual things, they could hire Lebanese brain while still in Lebanon and things like that. This be, could be big help to Lebanon. The third element that also weighing on Lebanon from a demographic point of view is the presence of the Syrian displaced and everything. And in addition to the Palestinians, if those, trust me, there are more areas in Syria that are safer than Lebanon. In addition, not only what they take economically out of Lebanon, from infrastructure point of view, we're not equipped for them. Second, most they say 80% of the crimes committed in Lebanon are by those displaced and a lot of other things. And that we're afraid that they will remain in Lebanon and this will tip the whole demographic. Imagine 2 million become Lebanese. Lebanon is a country of 4 million, a little over 4 million. 
which means now the Christian is like 37, 38% on papers you know, and everything. With this, then the Christian all of a sudden become 20%, and this will destroy the whole demographic of Lebanon. Then the Christian will lose even their political role. And when they finish, you know, when their political role in Lebanon is in jeopardy, that means the holy Christians of the Middle East, they feel lost. Because Lebanon for them is the last haven for all the Christians of the Middle East. That this is the place where they have like little beacon of hope. The minute Lebanon is gone, the Christian all over the Middle East would. That's why from help solve the issues of the dis Syrian displaced and find solution for the Palestinian refugee out of camp Lebanon. There is so many other places they could go to help economically, especially for education, uh, job creation, hospitalization, and anything USAID could help from that perspective to provide. In addition to supporting the Lebanese army, I still believe, uh, as the ambassador said, this is because otherwise we would lose it. The minute the government that's able to pay it, Hezbollah will tap into that and will have a lot of more influence. And also try to make sure to hold the Lebanese government accountable for any uh, inappropriation of funds and, and it's not making sure and any to be transparent, to be proper, to do what's right for the government of Lebanon, uh, for the people of Lebanon, so that they will have some kind of a trust. There is hope for a better future. And this will give a new hope for Lebanon. This was the apostolic exhortation back in 1997. This maybe now will be a true new hope for Lebanon. So that the Christian would feel there is some hope for me. And there is a mission for me to stay in this part of the world. To witness and to be an, a factor of a freely modernization, uh, coexistence, conviviality, co uh, toleration and peaceful existence with all the people around me. I think the American government would, could make a major, major uh, impact from that. And if United States takes that file into special importance, the whole Western world would follow through as one. And, you know, it carry also its weight with many Arab countries. You know, even Arab countries now, they don't want to deal with Lebanon, and that's why. I think their involvement would, would bring everybody else to the table and would help us tremendously from that point. We want the United States to take a leadership role, maybe to appoint somebody's special envoy to, to tell, just to send a message that Lebanon is important, to, to, to carry on that, to tell them you're not wasted, you're not lost, we're here to support you in every way. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, Ambassador, uh, I want to, Ambassador Fernandez, I want to turn to you and ask a somewhat similar question, but you know, you, you laid out for us nicely the sort of how you have the healthy aspects and then also that sort of parasitic aspect within Lebanon. Uh, in the framework of the administration's mission to really counter Iran's regional ambition, uh, what are some action items or L uh, ways that they could support that healthy aspect while uh, sort of cutting away at the cancer, if you will, uh, within Lebanon? Well, I would say, first of all, I mean, it's all, always important to remember, I'm, I'm a big believer in helping Lebanon. The U.S. for the last 15 years has given billions mm -hmm. of dollars to Lebanon, billions of dollars to support Lebanese institutions. Uh, so it's not like the United States hasn't given money. Some people would say that money went down the rat hole, around the, down the toilet, in terms that while the U.S. was giving money, uh, the political class was selling Lebanon out more and more and more to Hezbollah. So American money has gone to Lebanon over the last 15 years. The way I see it very concretely, what we need to do is we need to be more supportive, and I'll get what I mean more supportive, and more punitive at the same time. What I mean by that is our assistance has been through the years, I think, too open-ended. It actually has been not conditioned enough. Uh, it's been too much about process, the pr process of building an institution, supposedly building state institutions like the military, like other parts of the government that were politically compromised or could be politically compromised by Hezbollah influence. So the way I see it is, our support needs to be there, but it needs to be more targeted, more nuanced. 
So we need to challenge Hezbollah in building up an effective internal counterweight to Hezbollah. That's how we challenge Hezbollah in Lebanon. Now, some would say that's the LAF, and I'm not discounting that, but it has to be more than that. Either the United States or its allies needs to find ways to support a broader aspect of civil society, media, economic development, and others that are in contradistinction and opposition to Hezbollah. It can't be more business as usual. Here, we're going to give you money, and on paper, supposedly, we're, you're, you're, you're independent. But actually, behind the scenes, if Hezbollah tells you to jump, you're going to jump. Uh, so that's one, is building that kind of effective internal counterweight. The second thing I would say, which is very Lebanese-oriented, is building up Lebanese Shia opposition to Hezbollah. Hezbollah, obviously, is opposed to anyone who is against it whether they be Christians, whether they be Druze, whether they be Sunni, uh, Sunni Muslims, but they are particularly sensitive and particularly nervous about opposition and criticism coming from their own community. That's why, for example, they threaten and try to marginalize uh, voices that speak out in that community. There was a campaign they did a while back called Shia as Safara, the Shia of the embassy meaning the American embassy, you know, meaning supposedly that these are puppets or whatever. Uh, I think the West and the United States needs to be much more supportive of not people we control. These are not people that are puppets. These are people that are free to speak whatever they want. They can criticize America. They can criticize Hezbollah. But voices that are independent and they're truly critical about what Hezbollah is doing to the country. So that's a positive. Those two are two positive things that we can do. The third thing is a negative thing which we need to do, which is just like we need to be more supportive of Lebanon, of kind of the ground game of helping people on the ground. And, and the bishop is absolutely right. There are many creative ways that we can do in helping small business, civil society, education, political uh, media, et cetera, that they can be small scale, but high impact. So that's very much something we could do. But the, 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 the punitive part of what we need to do is just like Lebanon is a parasite, uh, just excuse me, just like Hezbollah is a parasite on Lebanon, what Hezbollah also does is it's diversified over time. This is an organization that came out of the Shia community, but Hezbollah, just like Iran, has wanted to diversify its support area beyond that religious community. They've tried to do that in Iraq, by the way. They've tried to do that with, say, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. The same thing happens in Lebanon. The punitive thing that we need to be looking at is prosecuting those non-Lebanese Hezbollah and often non-Shia facilitators of Lebanon, of, of Hezbollah's hold on power in Lebanon. Uh, there's been talk of this for years. There's been talk, there's been talk of Magnitsky uh, sanctions, for example, on politicians and businessmen who are basically bagmen for Hezbollah, bagmen for Iran, but they may not be Shias. They may not be you know, even Muslims. Uh, they may be Christians. They may be whatever. The time has come for people to decide. America needs to do more in Lebanon. It needs to do more on the ground in Lebanon. It needs to help uh, institutions, like-minded institutions, individuals. It needs to kind of develop this ground game in a deeper and more sensitive way. But at the same time, it needs to punish in a deeper, more sensitive way. Rather than holding the Lebanese people as hostages to a kind of an anti-Iran, anti-Hezbollah policy is to be more clear cut and to basically say, we see you, politician X, we see you as a facilitator of Hezbollah's hegemony on the country and you're going to pay a price for that. You're gonna pay a very specific price when it comes to sanctions and when it comes to punitive measures by the United States, you're gonna to have to choose who's going to cause you more pain, the United States in the West or Hezbollah.
Thank you. Uh, Robert, coming to you before we go to questions. Um, so understanding that really complex but important dynamic that you laid out, uh, but with you know the threat that Hezbollah represents, but the unique uh, potential for a relationship between Israel and Lebanon and their unique histories. Uh, is there a way that the administration can advance that specifically that agenda to ensure the security of Israel uh, while also ensuring the stability of Lebanon? Is, is there a way to advance both those without sort of compromising one for the other? Yes, it's a good question. It's one I think about quite a bit. Um, I, I agree with everything that was said up until now. So I'll state that for the record and then add just a couple more points. I do think that, you know, when it comes to advocacy, I think there's a lot that could be done in this country in the realm of, you know, call it rhetoric or education. I said, I said before, and I stand by this, and I think many Lebanese would as well, that Lebanon is truly exceptional, right? It's part of the Arab world, but it's also something different. It's Christian, but it's also not. It's a, it's, it's a very different thing, and it has, it has a reason uh, for existing. And I don't think that has been sufficiently communicated. Now, there are reasons for that. Obviously, Lebanese Christians are, as His Excellency mentioned, often accused of being in bed with the West, and they often go out of their way to prove that that's not the case. Um, but, the, but the bottom line is that the Christian nature of Lebanon it's, is important. It's important to us on the call. It's important, I think, to that founding purpose and that vocation of the country, and it needs to be stated, and it needs to be stated more clearly. And I, and I understand there are sensitivities, but if Lebanon is not exceptional, then there's no reason why I should be paying attention to it, or anyone, any more than Bahrain and Algeria, right? You need to tell me, the American citizen, why this country merits blood and treasure, essentially. So I think in terms of the, the rhetoric, the education, that's really important because what that does is it builds up political will in this country uh, that the administration can then use to do more. I agree 100% we need to do more. I, I say double down, but you can't get there, especially in the Middle East these days, without a very compelling case to the American citizen. And you have the raw materials, but for whatever reason, they're often not employed. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, and this is, I think, a really positive um, development that's happened, is that the U.S. should play or continue to play a very uh, strong uh, convening or mediating role on the question of Lebanon and Israel's uh, boundary, both land boundary and, and maritime boundary. This has come up, as probably most people on the call know, mostly in response to the discovery of natural gas in the Mediterranean Sea, but it presents a really unique opportunity for settling this border once and for all. And if done right, it's not easy, but if done right, it could remove the stated purpose for Hezbollah's activity, right? It's saying that it's, it exists to repel Israeli aggression. Once that boundary is, is set and determined, everyone can turn to Hezbollah and say, I don't know what you're talking about. This, this is already taken care of. And in general, I think that the U.S. should try to think more carefully and creatively about other things that would erode Hezbollah's legitimacy. Uh, Ambassador mentioned already working with uh, Shiite dissenters. I think there's a lot that could be done in the realm of civil society that would aim toward um, you know, redoing what happened in 2005 with the Cedar Revolution. Uh, I think that's a great model. The last thing I would say is that I think the U.S. administration should be working very closely with Israel to um, uh, mitigate or minimize conflict um, in the event that conflict arises. Again, I think it's there's a very strong possibility, if not today, tomorrow, and if not tomorrow, maybe the next day. To me, it seems like only a matter of time. And I know the administration is working closely with Israel on this, but uh, I'm repeating it uh, for emphasis. Um, if war breaks out, I think it's in everyone's best interest that you know, areas or facilities that are not connected to Hezbollah are left alone. And I know the Israeli military does the best as it, as it can to try to 
parse those distinctions, but I think we should be uh, repeating that refrain quite a bit and actually trying to weigh in with very specific recommendations of things that are on the table for conflict and things that aren't. But I think that we all need to realize, and this is an important point, that this um, kicking the can down the road situation that we've had on our hands now for a few years is not sustainable. It's, it's bound to boil over and conflict will come again. I think it will be worse than 2006. And I do think that whether it's intentional or unintentional, Christian areas or non Hezbollah areas will be affected. So I think that even as we work and work hard to save Lebanon, to protect it, and we've talked about a few things here on this call about the Lebanese army and other institutions that are important to protect, that we also recognize the possibility, even the likelihood that conflict will come and that even collapse could come, especially as this current generation of leaders, this let's call it the civil war era, uh, dies off one by one. I think that we need to be thinking about what do we do in the event that conflict does break out? How do we save the best parts of Lebanon? How do we protect them? How do we make sure that all the bad stuff is destroyed, all the the cancer, as Ambassador Fernandez has mentioned, um, but all the healthy cells are, are protected. I mean, it's it's not pessimistic or defeatist to say such things and to base even strategy um, on those lines because you know we've been how many years since Hezbollah has been in Lebanon? No one has succeeded in disarming them. It's unlikely that in the next year or two years anyone else will. Conflict will likely come. Then what? What happens the day after? I don't think enough people are asking that question. And if you care about strategy and building kind of plan A's and plan B's, you have to be thinking about that. And I think that we should be thinking about that together with Israelis and where we can, uh, those, those parts of the Lebanese regime and Lebanese population that are on the right side of this. Thank you, Robert. Okay, we're gonna sh shift now to uh, questions from our viewers and we have had a lot come in, so we'll try to get to as many as possible uh, and avoid any redundancy here. Um, first of all, we have a question uh, from William uh, from uh, Fordham Law School. Uh, and he asks, is Russia, despite its conduct in other regions of the world, looked on favorably as a protector of Christians in Lebanon? Um, i.e. something like uh, the return of the czar, uh, like it's the Holy Land or something of that nature. And I want to direct that to actually Ambassador Fernandez to address sort of Russia's role in the region. Are they seen favorably? Well, um, that's a key element of Russian propaganda, um, presenting themselves that way. It has a small grain of truth, as propaganda often has. But, um, you know, Russia is in the Middle East for Russia's interests in the Middle East, which are to project power, to uh, win friends and influence people and get arms contracts and get deals uh, to diversify from uh, punishing American sanctions that go back from uh, when they annexed Crimea. So, so incidentally, you know, uh, uh, you know, Russia talks about this and it's, it's an element of Russian propaganda and the Russian government talks about it, and especially true with uh, uh, the Greek Orthodox, the Levant. It's a kind of maybe beyond this, this, uh, this uh, uh, event, but there's a long history going back about 120 years where the Russian, the Tsarist Russia, help the uh, Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Antioch, that would be Syria, Lebanon, that part of, of the Middle East, of the leadership of the Patriarchate being wrested away from Greeks to Arab Christians. So there's a long history of basically Russia's role with especially Orthodox Christians. Um, I, I don't think in Lebanon it's seen any more than it is anywhere else. It splits along political lines. If you're one of those Christians, and there are Christians in Lebanon who see themselves this way, that are pro-Assad and pro-Hezbollah, you're very likely to be pro-Russia and to applaud Russia's actions in the region. 
If you're a Christian in the Middle East, in Lebanon or elsewhere, that see yourself as part of the West, to see yourself as part of a, uh, a, 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 a continuity of tradition which connects the, the Christians of the Middle East to those of the West, especially those in the Latin tradition or the Catholic tradition, you're less likely to see yourselves as, uh, you know, uh, uh, that Russia is some kind of panacea, that Russia is some kind of, of, uh, of, of supporter of Christians. So like so many other things in the Middle East, it's complicated. And the answer would be yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take uh, an, uh, one of the questions here is from uh, Dr. Rami, and uh, he has a, a creative question. He says, uh, what is the chance that the U.S. administration uh, would support a quick international tribunal uh, to investigate corruption and fraud in Lebanon? Uh, and wondering if that might set off um, a process of changes to the current rigid, really sort of status quo mindset that exists in the little political structure in Lebanon. And I'm going to actually, I'm going to ask uh, Your Excellency Zidane to start start us off on that. And then if uh, Ambassador yeah. Michelson uh, want to My experience in. with international tribunals, they take forever. Look mm -hmm. into the assassination of uh, Prime Minister Hariri and all the difference. It still happened, the crime happened 2005 and a couple of years after, and we still don't have. If they're going to wait 15, 20, 30 years, uh, you know, if you want something quick within a year, yes, I understand. And this is, should be everybody brought to court, all those people who ripped off Lebanon and stole all the, uh, the you know, and for, but otherwise, if it's going to take years, and leave the situation as it is, uh, then Lebanon will be history. It has anyone, be anything you want to add, gentlemen? Yeah, I would add one thing. Um, there's there's a real opportunity. Uh, Lebanon is, of course, and we haven't talked about this, is in a catastrophic financial situation. Uh, and it needs help. It needs help from the international community. And that means help from the West. Because all these... Uh, you know, awful countries that we talk about, Iran, Russia, and all of these, they don't have any money. It's the West that has money still. Uh, and it's Western institutions like the IMF. The United States is a key voice in the IMF. Mm -hmm. Lebanon wants support from the IMF. It's not going to get it unless the United States agrees to that. So we have, uh, we have uh, an ability to pressure there. I think uh, uh, moves on corruption, I think that's a really smart idea. The problem is, if we're not careful, what you're going to see in Lebanon is corruption used as a political tool, which is basically people in power who are close to Hezbollah and control the government are going to use corruption uh, accusations to go after their enemies. Uh, so there has to be a way to get kind of something which is seen as transparent uh, to, 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 for, for us to get something from uh, our IMF support. By the way, another thing that we need to look at, not just corruption, is Lebanon should be looked at very closely, the Lebanese state today, on how it uses its coercive powers. If the Lebanese government is using its powers to persecute people in the opposition, to torture demonstrators, to silence the press, it shouldn't think that it's going to get support from the West. Mm -hmm. You can't get Western money and be in Hezbollah's pocket at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, this question uh, uh, for Mr. Nicholson, uh, this is from Angela, and she, uh, she says she's just finished up an MRA at Yale Divinity School and is becoming much more interested in the current situation of Christians uh, in the Middle East, uh, and is really sort of wondering, given that the president has, that President Trump has a role to play throughout the region, uh, if you were to be sort of sitting in the Oval Office as his policy advisor, where would you place Lebanon sort of a, on a priority ranking for him as something he should be looking at in the region? At the top, number one, number one, I would say for the for his religious freedom agenda, yes. For his Iran agenda, yes. For his Israel agenda, yes. It is the number one issue in the region, notwithstanding how small and seemingly insignificant it is. I've had people, uh, like official people tell me that uh, Lebanon is just not strategic. And while I understand how that argument is made, I think it's, I think it's just dead wrong. So I would say 
Lebanon should be near the top. Uh, and, and in general, when it comes to religious freedom, and I've written about this, and I'm a little unorthodox uh, when it comes to the way that I think about religious freedom for Christians and other uh, religious minorities, you know, there, there's something about uh, the Middle East that makes our current approach to religious freedom um, ineffective. And our current approach I would describe as an approach largely based, not exclusively, but largely based on statements, resolutions, petitions, manifestos, right? Various creeds that, you know, explain or declare our support or other people's support for religious freedom. And when you're in the Middle East, it's just not the way, it's just not the way it works, at least not these days. Um, religious freedom in the Middle East, in my opinion, needs to be um, embodied, right? It needs to have mass and take up space. I think that we, in the West, we think about it in very, I don't know if it's Western terms or Christian terms, but we think about uh, terrestrial life, you know, politics and states and societies. And then we think about celestial life, all the heavenly things that we do inside of our hearts or inside of our churches. And religion in the Middle East is, is not so bifurcated. It's not so compartmentalized. It's, it's very much part of one's identity and it's, and it's in all three dimensions. And so I think that as we think about these communities protecting them, we need to think about their world as they see it. And for many of these people, that will involve some mixture of um, conversations about decentralization or federalism, it, it, sometimes about territory or security, about um, the way these territories are administered. I think there's, there's much more that needs to be done uh, on religious freedom that is tangible, right? And I think that Lebanon, to the extent that it's, I always describe Lebanon as the closest thing to a Christian country in the Middle East. It's the way that I kind of catch people's attention who've never, ever, ever thought about Lebanon in those terms. I think that to the extent that it is sort of like that, right? It's kind of a, a quasi Christian state of some sort that it embodies the religious freedom agenda, right? It's got mass, it takes up space. There's a government, there's security. You can, you can build something real that has a footprint. And so I think that we, uh, should take advantage of that and see Lebanon as the number one way that we can help Christians in the whole region, right? We can't, we can't do everything for everyone, but we can do this one thing really well. And I think that we should therefore focus that whole portfolio in the Near East um, on this country, because if we can get a big win in Lebanon for religious freedom um, in, in, its, in its widest definition, I think that it will have a ripple effect um, everywhere else as well. Thanks, Robert. Uh, Ambassador Fernandez, I'm going to direct one more question towards you. Uh, and this is, uh, I think there's a really interesting and helpful question. Uh, it's the, the questioner asks, uh, how much is Lebanese instability, uh, Lebanon's instability a result of economic collapse? And how much is it a result of sectarianism and Iranian involvement? Obviously, there's an interplay between the two factors. Uh, but to what extent would economic stability uh, really mitigate the tensions between factions? Well, I, I think, first of all, I, I'm one of those, there's, there, there are many views on this. Uh, I, I am not one of those that think that sectarian, the, the sectarian system in Lebanon is necessarily a problem. I don't think that's true at all. In my experience in the Middle East, there is de facto sectarianism throughout the Middle East. It's just often not enshrined the way it is in Lebanon with, you know, the head of the military is going to be a Maronite and this guy is going to be a Shia and that person is going to be Greek Orthodox and stuff like that. But sectarianism is a reality in the region. So the sectarian system per se in Lebanon is not the problem. Uh, but I, I think the, 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 the problem is you have a predatory ruling class which has become dependent on a, a, a very comfortable situation and is connected in some way or another with a kind of vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, go along to get along relationship with Hezbollah. Uh, if, if Lebanon was to improve economically, 
it's not necessarily going to help much of what we what we're talking about. Yes, so poor people who are starving today would be helped, and 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 that is a legitimate thing to look at. But basically, Lebanon has become a milk cow. It was a milk cow for the Syrian, for the Assad regime for years. And after the Lebanese people heroically in 2005 uh, were able to get uh, the Syrian regime to leave, it transformed very shortly from being an Assad regime milk cow, milk, milk cow to being a Hezbollah slash Iran milk cow. So the problem isn't the absence or the, or the presence of the milk, uh, the, the problem is the owner of the cow, <laughs> the guy who's calling the shots. That's why it's so important for us to pressure and to be kind of uh, hard nosed when it comes to the Lebanese elite. They need to be afraid of us almost as much or as much as they are afraid of Hezbollah as well. Thank you, Ambassador. Well, I want to be conscious and respectful of everyone's time. This has been a fantastic conversation. I want to thank our three panelists for their excellent comments. We had many, many more questions come in that we weren't able to get to. They were excellent questions. Uh, we thank you to our participants and everyone who joined on Zoom, everyone who joined on Facebook Live. Uh, we appreciate you guys engaging with this important conversation. Uh, we do, we're doing weekly throughout this, uh, this quarantine period where people have a little more time to engage with some of this online content. We've been doing weekly member calls. We have coming one coming up this week and more information will be sent out to you on that. If you want to engage with those as well, uh, but please continue to engage. IDC will continue this conversation. We're going to continue to speak with lawmakers and officials in Washington to educate them on this issue. And we encourage you to do so as well and engage with us through that. Again, uh, thank you so much to our panelists and everyone have a wonderful afternoon. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.